All right, guys, take your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I've got a lot to cover today, so um, I'm going to maybe not put as much depth into some of the verses as I normally would. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, just verse number 9, it says there, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. The title of the sermon this morning is, My grace is sufficient. Okay, my grace is sufficient. Let's start with verse number 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So if you remember the last two chapters, you've got Paul defending himself against the accusations coming his way by critical believers in the church, accusations coming his way against by the false apostles, false brethren in the church. And again, he just repeats this idea, hey, it's not profitable, it's not expedient for me uh, to glory. Okay, it's not good to do this. But he says one last thing he's got to mention here. He says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. You see, the Lord was working in the life of Paul. Okay? It wasn't just that one time that Christ came on the road to Damascus challenging Paul, but Paul actually received real visions and revelations directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the other apostles had Jesus to teach him for those three years in his ministry, whereas Paul had Jesus teaching him from heaven. Okay, and as we'll see in the next few verses, we see that it is actually Paul that was caught up to heaven, receiving a lot of his teaching and revelations directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse number two. Now, I used to read these verses thinking that Paul was referring to some other man. When I studied out this time, I'm starting to realize now that uh, uh, Paul is actually speaking of himself. But he's speaking of himself in the third person. And I'll, I'll tell you my reasons why he's doing that in a minute. But verse number two, when he says, I knew a man, think about himself. Okay, he's talking about himself in the third person. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, what is the third heaven? Okay, so the first heaven is our atmosphere, is our sky. The second heaven is, I guess, what we would call outer space, where the stars and the planets are. And the third heaven, we'll see, I'll prove this to you later, is where the throne of God is. This is where, what we tend to call heaven, when we go soul winning, we say, are you sure your soul will be in heaven? We're talking about being with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the third heaven. We'll see that soon, okay? So 14 years ago, um, he was in heaven. Now, whether he was in his body, his physical body, he's not sure, or whether he was just caught up in the spirit, the, the way John the Apostle was when he wrote the, the book of Revelation, he says he was caught up in the spirit. But physically, his body was still on the Isle of Patmos. So Paul's not sure. Now, if you also remember in the previous chapter, Paul spoke about having all the sufferings that he went through, all the affliction. He even speaks of deaths. Remember that? So, you know, we're not sure exactly whether he actually died. Now, it's possible in one of his, his uh, deaths, where he was maybe potentially put to death, that he was caught up into heaven in the spirit in that way as, as well. You know, Paul's not entirely sure about this, whether in the body, not sure. Because I'm, ass I'm assuming if you receive this, this revelation, this vision, where you're actually in heaven, boy, it's going to dazzle your senses, okay? It's, it's, it's hard to take in in this physical body. So he's not sure about that, but this took place 14 years ago. Now, just to give you some idea, this book, 2 Corinthians, was written about 56 AD. Okay, approximately people will sort of say about 56 AD. And Jesus Christ was crucified, caught up into heaven, at least by 30 AD. So you've got this period of 26 years. So when, when Paul says, you know, uh, from where Christ was ascended to the right hand of the Father, to the time this was written, so you can see how 14 years could easily have passed by. Paul was already serving at least that, that, that long um, in the ministry, okay? Now, now, one reason I believe he remains vague here is because he just finished saying, hey, it's not profitable for me to glory and to boast. And so instead of him talking about himself going to heaven, he talks about it in the third person, okay? And um, it's, again, it's so opposite to the way so-called charismatic, you know, experiences or people going into heaven is, right? When, when someone talks about their experiences to heaven, they love to write a book about it, sell millions of copies, you know, and bring all the attention to themselves. Paul's very careful. I, I knew a man, right? He's talking to the third person. Though I think it's clear that it's definitely himself. And I'll explain to you in a minute who that man is, okay? Um, verse number three. 
And I knew such a man, uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Okay, so again, was he caught up physically or not or just spiritually? He's not sure, but God knows. That's not what's so important. Verse number four, how that he was caught up into paradise. So what is heaven called in the Bible? The third heaven. It's paradise. Okay, paradise is the third heaven. And he says, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he says, look, when I was in heaven, when Jesus was giving me these revelations, there were things that I heard, uh, unspeakable words, okay? There are certain things in heaven, and I don't fully understand this, and I think we can understand why Paul is not even sure if he was in the body or not. But there are words, there are things, there are teachings in heaven, there are doctrines. It's like your senses are, are, are you know, are, are, it's like we're, you know, we know we're limited in this body. We know we're limited in this temporal world, but there is knowledge, there is teaching that we can't even speak about here on this earth. It's not possible for us in our flesh and blood to teach these things. I mean, the Bible tells us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so when we think about heaven, yes, it's a physical place. We're going to be with the Lord forever. But it's like our, our ability to understand, to take things in, to speak about things is eternal as well. It's never ending. Like we're, we're definitely limited in the place we are. You know, we often speak about what are we going to be doing for billions of years when we're in heaven? Boy, I don't think we fully understand just how much learning there is to be had, how much more there is to know the nature of eternity, the nature of God. I mean, it's, it's you know, Paul can't even figure out if he was in the body or not when he received all this stuff. But it's unspeakable words. And then it says, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So this idea that, you know, uh, uh, you know, if I even try to speak the things that I spoke of, it doesn't, um, it doesn't serve justice. You know, if, if I'd even tried to speak about those things, I, I wouldn't be able to. I, I wouldn't be able to justify what I heard there. That's why it's kind of unlawful for me to utter. But the thing that I wanted to cover here very quickly is the doctrine of paradise. Okay? Because there's a, there's a lot of false teaching on what paradise is. Okay? And this is a clear verse. Nobody can deny what it says here, right? He was caught up into paradise, which is what? The third heaven. It's where the throne of God is. Okay? Hold your finger there. Please turn to Luke 23. Turn to Luke 23. And let me um, just teach, show you um, some of the false teaching that's on this topic of paradise. Luke 23, please. Luke 23, verse 39. Luke 23. Actually, yeah, turn there anyway. Luke 3, look, sort of a different place to what I, th what I thought I was turning to, but it's okay. Luke, 20, Luke 23, 39. Luke 23, 23, 39. So this is a story, of course, when Jesus Christ was on the cross and he had the two thieves side by side uh, accusing him, accusing him. But then one thief realizes his error of his ways and, and he turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. He believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost, thou, uh, dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man have, nothing, have done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You see how this thief on the cross has now placed his faith on Jesus Christ. He knows this is not the end. He knows Jesus Christ is going to be resurrected, right? He's going to enter into his kingdom. And he says, I want to be part of that. Can you please remember me? That's all he could really quote. Okay, but we can see his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the powerful words of Jesus in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. In paradise. Now, from what we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where is paradise? Heaven, right? So where did Jesus say he was going to be with this uh, newly saved thief? Today, that very day that they died on the cross in paradise, in heaven. Okay, now any child can put these together and yeah, okay, a saved person dies and goes to heaven. But there's this false teaching that Jesus, or what I should say, this thief actually went to paradise in hell. Okay, so in hell where there's hellfire, where there's fire and brimstone, where the wrath of God is being poured upon the wicked, the teaching is that there is this place in hell 
which is called paradise. It's a nice part of hell. There's no fire. Okay, it's, there's no fire there. It's just a place where um, the Old Testament saints used to go when they, when they would die. And they waited for Jesus Christ to die on the cross before they can go to heaven. And I kind of understand that thinking, you know, the idea that Jesus had to die on the cross. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, he, the effectiveness of his death and his shed blood was effective from day one, was effective from Adam and Eve. Okay, so, you know, there's this teaching and I'll get you to turn to chapter 16, please. Luke 16, so we can put a few of these things together. So I, I just want to clarify, look, Jesus says the thief would be in paradise and he says he'd be with him. So where was Jesus when he died? Paradise as well. Okay, paradise as well. He was in heaven as well. Okay, now I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute because I know some of you guys will have questions as soon as I say that. But go to Luke 16 verse 19. Luke 16 verse 19. This is the story that Jesus Christ gives of the rich man and Lazarus um, and, and the story of them both passing away and dying. Look at verse 19, Luke 16, 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell by the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Pay attention to these words. Carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now the false teaching of paradise is they also say, well, another name for paradise is Abraham's bosom. So this paradise in hell, this place which is, has no fire or torment in hell, is also called Abraham's bosom. And this is where they get the teaching from, that he was carried into this place called Abraham's bosom. But what is a bosom? <laughs> what if I say bosom, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a chest. All right. So either, I mean, look, again, if, if we just know what the word bosom means, then what does this mean? Do I have this little child? Let me, let, me, let me take Emmy here for a minute. Emmy, come with me. So let's say Emilia passed away and, and she's saved. That means the angels took Emmy and put her into, let's pretend I'm Abraham, into Abraham's bosom, right? And if she's in my bosom, what does that mean? I can comfort her, you know, I can console her and say, it's all going to be good from now on. I know you suffered. I know you were begging for food, but now you've made it to paradise, right? You made it to heaven. You're going to be comforted forever. And, you know, that should be the natural reading, right? You're carried into Abraham's bosom. And this makes sense if we continue reading what that uh, chapter says. Let's keep reading that chapter. What was I up to, guys? Into Abraham's bosom. Sorry. Yeah, verse 22. The rich man also died and was buried. So they both died. And now talking about the, the rich man. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So, Abraham, it's Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. He's being held by Abraham. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is what? Comforted, right? He's been held by Abraham. But, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us, but would come from hence. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Okay, so we see this teaching here that this rich man is able to speak to um, Abraham. Okay, and because they think of this place in hell, they think there's this, this, this uh, you know, nice, I don't know, what, what do we call this? A, a, a nice, what's a, what's a good way of a, a paradise, you know, a resort in hell. And so they think from the fires of hell, somebody's able to talk to Abraham in hell as well, but in the nice resort of hell. 
Okay? And as we saw here, there's this chasm separating the two. And people say, well, see, there's a chasm. So if the rich man is in hell and we know that's in the center of the earth, then surely this paradise, this resort is also in the center of the earth. Otherwise, how can they communicate? And that kind of idea is, yeah, it kind of makes sense because if we're in our physical bodies, if someone's on the other side of a chasm, it's got, it, yeah, you can only communicate them if they're, if they're decent distance apart, right? But this is not a physical realm. Okay, their souls have one has gone to paradise, which is the Bible says, oh, well, Abraham, well, Abraham's bosom, we'll cover that in a minute, which should be paradise, should be heaven, and the other one has gone to hell. This is, a, this is now a spiritual world, this is a spiritual realm, this is where their souls are, this isn't restricted by any physical bodies. And so, what I'm saying to you is that Lazarus went where Abraham was, where all the believers were, where all those that were saved by faith are, which is in heaven. And the rich man is in hell. So, what's the chasm? What's the chasm? The chasm is the separation between heaven and hell. Once you're saved, you cannot be damned to hell. And once you go to hell, you cannot go to heaven. Okay? Judgment has already been laid upon you, either by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ or rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see how silly it is to sort of say, well, oh, he was taken into Abraham's bosom. Though it's very clear that he's being held and comforted by Abraham. Okay. Now what they'll say is, well, hold on. He's not on Abraham's bosom. It says that the, what did it say in verse, sorry, let me have a look at it again. Verse number 22, it says, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And so they'll look at my, what I'm saying as silly teaching because it's kind of like, well, did Abraham open up his cavity of his bosom and then receive, you know, Lazarus in there? But you'll see, look, and, and I want to prove this to you. Um, so please, I'll get you to turn to, um, actually, I didn't write down the reference. I didn't write down the reference, but I, I want you to see this. Uh, all right, just give me one second to find it. But uh, turn to the book of Genesis while you can. Turn to Genesis. Genesis 16, verse 5. Genesis 16, verse 5. Actually, verse 4. Genesis 16, verse 4. Have a look at this. This is the story of Abraham again. So we've got the same person in the Bible. Okay. And this is the story where um, Abraham and Sarah lacked faith that God was going to give him that promised child. So um, Sarah gives Abraham Hag Haggai, her, her maidservant, to become his wife. And he, he went into her and obviously they had Ishmael as their son. But if you look at verse number four, it says, And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. You see Abraham's bosom there. Right, the, his, her, the maid um, Haggai was received into his bosom, meaning he was with her. Okay, it's not that he opened up his chest cavity and received Haggai. Okay, so this is, and if you look up this word into into your bosom, this is a phrase that's used throughout the whole Bible. Okay, it's not talking about going to a place called Abraham's bosom, but being held by someone, being being rested upon their chest, upon their body. So I just wanted to prove that to you from the Old Testament. That language is used for Abraham's bosom as well, but obviously that's not talking about a place of the dead. Okay? And again, you do a search for yourself in the Bible, you see that consistently in the Bible. Alright, now, let's keep going. I've got, I've got a few things I want to cover here as well. Turn to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. And I know we're not, we're not really covering 2 Corinthians 12 all that much here, but I felt like as soon as we got to this topic of paradise, because there's so much false teaching, this is something I had to cover. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 31. Acts chapter 2, verse 31. Now, do we believe the King James Bible is the perfect, preserved Word of God? Do we believe it's perfect? Do we believe it's accurate? Can we trust it? 
Do we trust it? Okay, we can. We can trust every word of this book. Okay, so look at Acts chapter 2, verse 31. It says this, And sing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ. Look at this now. That his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So let me ask you this. Before Christ was resurrected, according to the Bible, we trust. Okay? We know it's 100% accurate. Where was the soul of Jesus Christ? In hell. You see that? The Bible says that his soul would not be left in hell, which is why he was resurrected from the dead. Okay? Verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So, and, and I'm not going to go into all of this right now, okay? Because the question is, well, what was Jesus doing for the three days and three nights that he was dead? Where was he? Well, look, I'm just going to trust the Bible. I'm going to trust the Bible to tell me exactly where he was. If you want to know where Jesus was, he was in three places, okay? His body was in the grave, his soul was in hell, but his spirit was in heaven, okay? Uh, actually, go to, I'm um, sorry, I should have told you to say that. Go to Luke chapter uh, 23 again, Luke 23, Luke 23, Luke 23. Again, just the crucifixion there, I just missed one important verse there, Luke 23, Luke 23, verse 46. Well, actually, you know, we read verse 43, right? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Well, hold on, Kevin. The Bible just said his soul was in hell. Yeah, but look at verse 46. 23, verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. Okay, the word ghost is synonymous with the word spirit. And you know, man, God, God has created man with a body, with a soul, and with a spirit. And if we believe that Jesus Christ is 100% man, but also 100% God, okay, if he's 100% man, that must mean when he was made flesh, he wasn't just flesh, but he had a soul and a spirit as well. So what we see in the Bible, his, his body was in hell. Sorry, his body was in the grave. His soul was in hell, but his spirit was with the Father. Okay, in paradise with the thief on the cross. So Kevin, please explain that to me. Look, that's what the Bible says. Okay, we, we have to accept it by faith. Okay, and this, this raises a lot of questions. I know one day I'm going to go deeper into this, but I just want to show you what the Bible says. Okay. And, and just show you some of the false teaching that's out there and just say, look, this is just ridiculous. If you just read it plainly for what it says, the third heaven is paradise. That's clear. Okay. And we don't need to start making up our own assumptions and our own ideas to start teaching, you know, other, other kinds of doctrines. There's no need to. We just accept it by faith. Jesus is 100% God. He can be in more places than once. Right. He can be in more places than once. What did he say to the Pharisees when he talked about himself? The sun which is in heaven. Okay, somehow Jesus Christ was on the earth speaking to the Pharisees, but in heaven at the same time. God is omnipresent. You know, God is, God is, you know, I don't fully understand all those things, but it's what the Bible teaches and I accept it by faith. Okay, let's move on. Um, we are going to get back to 2 Corinthians 12, right? Don't worry about that. But I just want to show you... Um, Guys, please turn to Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation 2, verse 7. Because I, I really just want to reinforce this to you. Where is paradise? Is it, is it the resort in, in fiery hell? No, I mean, the Bible tells us more than... This is, is, it's not just 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay, go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So let's get some ideas here. What's in paradise? The tree of life. Okay, we know the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, but God has another tree of life. Okay, God has another tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now go to Revelation 22, please. Revelation 22, verse 1. 
Revelation 22 verse 1. So to figure out what the paradise of God is, we just have to figure out where the tree of life is. Pretty straightforward, right? Yep. Not complicated. Revelation 22 verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Hey, where's the throne of God? In heaven, right? The throne of God is in heaven. And it says, verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Where is the tree of life? It's where the throne of God is. No one doubts where the throne of God is, right? It's in heaven. Okay, where is paradise? What is paradise? It's heaven. Okay, we, don't let, we, we have multiple witnesses of this. We have multiple witnesses of what paradise is. In hell? No, in heaven. Okay, God's throne is not in hell. Okay, uh, the tree of life is not in hell. Okay, it's in heaven. Okay, but specifically here in chapter 22, it's speaking about New Jerusalem. Okay, it, this is a reference of the new heavens and the new earth, the new city, God's throne is actually in this new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven to the earth. Now, I need to go on to some, another topic here, the bride of Christ, because I mentioned this on Friday. We're talking about husbands loving their wives, and we said how another false teaching that's out there is that just the New Testament church is the bride of Christ. Nowhere found in the Bible, though. Nowhere found in the Bible. So please turn to Revelation 21. Turn to Revelation 21, verse 1. Let's understand this a little bit more. All these things come together. I didn't really plan to, but it's just the way it sort of worked out with the sermons I was preaching. Revelation 21 verse 1. This is talking about the new heaven and the new, new earth. And I saw, this is after Christ's millennial rule in this earth. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, Where's it coming from? Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What is New Jerusalem? What is this new city? A bride prepared for her husband. Where's it coming from? From heaven. Okay, where God's throne is, what paradise is, where the tree of life is. The Bible's consistent. Okay, we don't have to play games with the Bible. The Bible's 100% consistent with these things. And you can see how the bride is actually New Jerusalem. It's a city. Now, the argument that might come your way says, well, hold on. It doesn't say it's the bride. It says prepared as a bride. You know, well, hold on. Okay, let's keep reading. Go to verse number 9. Revelation 21, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride. The lamb's wife. Who's the lamb? Jesus Christ. Okay. So this angel comes and says, I'm going to show you the bride. I'm going to show you the lamb's bride. Okay. The lamb's wife. The church. Uh, the New Testament church. Well, okay. He's going to show him. Verse number 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So you have the angel saying, hey, John, I'm going to show you the bride of Christ. I'm going to show you the bride of the Lamb. So he takes him to a high mountain and shows him the city. All right. So what's the bride of Christ? It's holy uh, Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem that came down from heaven. Okay. And all the saints. Remember, this new Jerusalem has the foundation of the, the names of the 12 apostles. But it also has the gates, the gates are 12 gates of the 12 tribes of Israel. Meaning, who resides in this city? both New Testament and Old Testament saints, saints of all time. So yes, that includes the New Testament church. Yes, we, are, we do make up the city, but it's not just the New Testament church. It's the saints of all time, okay? Because we're all one body. We're all one fold of God, okay? All saved in the same way by grace through faith. So I'm hoping I can just show you just, you know, with clear scriptures, black and white, easy to put together, just two false doctrines. That paradise is in hell, false doctrine number one, and uh, false doctrine number two, that only the New Testament church makes up the bride of Christ. You know? And sorry, we need to get back to 2 Corinthians 12. But I thought it was important that we cover that, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. 
I just need to turn back there as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. So Paul, again, speaking of this experience of going into heaven, verse number 5, of such and one will I glory. So it's, who's he glorying of? He's glorying of this man that he knew in the third heaven. Okay, He says, that's the man I'm going to glory of. Um, yet of myself will I not glory, but in mine infirmities. Okay, So he says, look, I don't want to glory about myself, but I am going to glory of such one. Um, sorry, look at verse number, verse number four again. How that he was caught up into paradise. He's talking about that man in paradise. He says, of that man I'm willing to glory of, but not of this man, not, not of myself. Okay, now I think this is, once we understand that this is about Paul, we actually understand what this is about. Okay, so he's talking about the new man. Okay, so what part of you can actually enter into heaven? We know flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We know flesh and blood cannot go into heaven, but the new man can, the new man can right? The new man, the new spirit in us. Okay, um, so in what should we glory of? The new man. He's saying, hey, of that man I can glory of because he's, he's fully righteous. He has the righteousness of Christ imputed upon him. This is what it allows him to even enter into paradise. This is what even allows him to enter into heaven. Of that he's willing to glory of because it's the righteousness of Christ, but not glory of himself upon this earth, in this flesh, okay? He's got his infirmities, he's got his weaknesses, and um, he's willing to glory of his infirmities. That's what he's willing to glory of because he suffered for Christ. It's for the name of Christ, okay? So, again, think about the experiences of so-called believers that went to heaven. What do they glory of, of themselves? Right. Right? Glory on themselves, selling their books, making money. That's not Paul's way. He speaks in the third person just to kind of put people off that he's not speaking of himself, but he is. He's glorying of the new man that is able to go to heaven. Okay? Verse number six. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. And I think he's talking about his flesh here. Like in my flesh, I would like to glory. I would like to boast of myself, but that would be foolish. For if I say the truth, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear. So I'm going to refrain from glorying, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. So he's willing to refrain from glorying, from stopping people thinking that he's more than just a man. Okay, he is just a man. He's got his infirmities. He has his weaknesses. That's who I really am. Okay, but hey, I did go to heaven. Okay, hey, the Lord did speak to me. Hey, I am a true apostle of Christ. Remember, he's defending his apostleship. He's um, defending himself from the criticism that came his way. Okay, verse number seven. And lest, I sh and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That word buffet means to, 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 uh, to sort of beat upon. Okay? Paul had a messenger of Satan that was beating him. Now, there's a lot of wonder as to what this messenger of Satan is. Okay? He calls it a thorn in the flesh. My personal opinion, it was some sort of weak, some sort of sort of sickness, some sort of ailment that he had. But again, Paul leaves it kind of vague. And it's important, it's not so much, a lot of people wonder, what was that messenger? What was that thorn in the flesh? That's not really what's important. What's important about, we'll see soon, is why he keeps it vague. Because the truth is, all of us, all of us, if you're going to live righteously for Christ, will have a thorn in the flesh. All of us will have a messenger of Satan that beats upon us. Okay, and, and it's important to have this. And he says there in verse seven, and lest I should, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, it, it, for you know, it, it, um, in order to prevent me from boasting, in order for, for for me to not be filled with pride, God has sent a difficulty in my way, so that I could be weak, so that I could be struggling with this thorn. You know, that thorn in the flesh is kind of like the idea of a splinter. Have you ever had a splinter in your flesh that's hard to get out? It's like painful and annoying and like, you know, you're trying to do things, but it's always there. It's always reminding you. It's always to remind you of that pain, that annoying pain. It's that kind of thing, right? Uh, it's like, you know, if, if, if God sees that we have the ability to, to be filled with pride and to boast of our accomplishments, he's going to send us that messenger of Satan. He's going to send us something to keep us humble and relying on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now look at verse number eight. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So it says, look, I prayed about it three times. Lord, please remove this thorn in my flesh. Please remove it. And God said, no. 
<laughs> okay. Now, this is just a reality. Look, we pray about things. We pray about health. Look, we have a lot of... Pr- look, actually, no. Prayers are always answered. Okay. You know, as long as you're right with the Lord, you're praying to Him, you're praying in His will, and you're praying in the Spirit, your prayers will always be answered. But sometimes the answer is no. Okay. And in this case, for Paul, the answer was no. Now, the thing is, some people have said, well, does that mean we only pray about things three times and then if, if, it, if it's not answered, we stop praying about it? No, I don't believe that's a teaching, okay? Because look at the next verse, number nine. This is why he stopped praying about it. This is why he stopped asking the Lord to remove it. And he said unto me, we know the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching Paul directly, okay? And so Jesus answers Paul and says, this is why it's not going to happen. My grace, he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So Jesus Christ told him, no, I'm not going to heal you from this thorn in the flesh because I want you to rely upon my grace. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. I don't want you to be boastful. I don't want you to be filled with pride. I want you to rely upon my grace. I want you to draw strength from me because you have the ability, Paul, to get prideful. You have the ability to get boastful. So I'm going to keep you in line. I'm going to keep you humbled, but I'm not going to leave you without. You can draw your strength from me. My grace is there for you. That's the teaching. That's why Paul stopped up three times. I'm not saying that if you have a condition, you have an ailment, you have a request from God. Hey, keep asking for it. Keep asking for it and until God himself tells you no. Okay, we have Paul. He, Jesus himself said, no, I'm not going to take that away from you because my grace is sufficient for you. And look, if you're going through hardships, you're going through trials, listen, this is the perfect time to draw upon the grace of God. This is the perfect time to draw strength from God because you're not going to be, do, you're not going to be able to overcome this in your own flesh. You're not going to be able to overcome it in your own power. You need the Lord God. Sometimes God will allow you to go through those difficulties, right? And, and sometimes maybe if you're going through difficulties, maybe ask the question, have I been a bit prideful? Do I need to be humbled? Okay, is this why I'm going through it? And in that case, thank you, Lord. I'm going to glory in the fact that you've given me this because now I know I can draw upon your strength. I can draw upon your grace. Okay. Verse number 10. And this is why I I believe this thought in the flesh is kind of vague. Though I I do believe it's uh, some sort of physical ailment. But I could be wrong. But look look at verse number 10. Therefore, I, I take pleasure in infirmities. That's infirmities, that's sicknesses in reproaches, people that hated him, in necessities, when he went without, when he, had ne- when he had necessities and they couldn't be met, in persecutions, when people were attacking him, in distresses, when he was in pain and anguish, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So this thorn of the flesh, vague on purpose, because the thorn in the flesh can be all these things. It can be the sicknesses. It can be people that are hating you. It can be when you're going without necessities in your life. It can be when you're physically attacked. It can be when you're mentally stressed and in anguish. All these things can be thorns in the flesh. And I think all of these, you know, at least one of these things we all struggle with in life. We're all going through one of these things. This is your thorn in the flesh that God has allowed you to have. He's allowed the messenger of Satan. He's allowed Satan to have his way with you a little bit. Okay, so that you would draw strength upon the Lord. Okay, but look, look at how it starts in verse number 10. Therefore, I take pleasure. All right, do we take pleasure in our struggles? Not really, right? But that's the teaching. We ought to take pleasure in it because we know the Lord is working in us. He wants us to draw from Him. And if the Lord wants that, then He's going to be able to deliver us through that difficulty, deliver us through that trial. Okay, I'm not promising you that all your sicknesses are going to be healed. Okay, I'm not promising you that, but I'm promising you this. If we're right with the Lord, we can still take pleasure in it. Okay, somehow Paul was able to take pleasure in all this because he knew the grace of God was available to him. He knew the strength of the Lord was in him. That's what made him strong. He goes, for when I'm weak, then am I strong. Okay, you're going to be the strongest when you're weak, drawing upon the strength of the Lord. Okay, verse number 11. I am become a fool in glory and you have compelled me. Um, like you have made me to have to glory about myself, right? Again, there were accusers in the church and they weren't defending Paul. They should have just turned around to these false accusers and said, look, shut up. We know Paul's an apostle of the Lord. He's gotten us saved. 
He cares about this church. He sends leaders and teachers into this church. But he says, because you've not done that, you've compelled me to glory. You've made me have to defend myself. Okay? For I ought to have been commended of you. See, you should have been the one speaking highly of me. Not me having to talk about this stuff. Okay, I've just spent now three chapters having to uh, reaffirm my apostleship to you. You know, and he says, look, you should have done this as a church, right? And look, I, I kind of feel, I, should, I don't know, I, I feel a bit embarrassed, like, I don't know, embarrassed saying this. But hey, if someone comes into the church attacking your pastor, attacking me, I shouldn't have to defend myself. Okay, I shouldn't have to do that. There should be enough people that will turn around and say, hey, shut up. Kevin has proven himself to us. He loves us. If you're going to have that critical spirit, then get out of this church. We don't want you here. Okay? That's how it should, that's how it should have been with Paul. But the church had failed him, had let him down. He goes, for, I, for in nothing, verse 11, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. He says, look, I, I'm just as effective. I'm just, uh, my, my authority is just as high as any other apostle. But then he says, though I be nothing. You know, he doesn't think highly of himself. You know, he's thankful for the apostleship that he has. But he tries not to boast, okay? He's, he's, he was able to achieve this in his life. Somehow he was able, as much as all the successes that he had, he was still a very humble man. Very humble man. Verse number 12. Truly, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, in wonders, and mighty deeds. So it says, look, I've come to you in all patience. I've been patient with you. <laughs> You've been a really bad church, but I've patiently loved you patiently taught you i've been there with you right um patiently dealing with them as a church in signs and wonders hey paul did miracles this affirmed his apostleship i'm assuming these false apostles weren't doing any of this i'm assuming they weren't even patient with the people okay they weren't doing real signs and wonders real signs real miracles and mighty deeds and i believe those mighty deeds are the establishment of churches seeing many people saved okay that's what the true apostle was doing Right? Not oil on their palms for no reason and gold dust in the air. No, real miracles. He was able to um, heal the sick. Like he was doing the same kind of miracles that Jesus Christ was able to do on this earth. That proved his apostleship. But not just the miracles. His patience for the church. His love for the church. And the mighty works of you know, spreading the kingdom of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the worlds. Verse 13. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches? Uh, oh, listen. Paul comes back to his sarcasm. Okay, Back to his sarcastic ways. He goes, For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches? He goes, So are you, in, like, because he's talking about himself, he's not inferior to the other apostles. And he says, And kind of like, you're not inferior to the other churches, but in what way are you inferior to the other churches? All right? That's what he's asking. In what way are you inferior? Because look, I've been here, I've been helping you. You've had all the resources and all the help every other church has been able to have. So in what way are you inferior? He says, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you. He says, this is how you're inferior to the other churches. You're not paying me. <laughs> Remember, he served them freely and he served them freely so he wouldn't be a burden to the church. He says, that's where you come short, that you were not there uh, paying, you know, putting your finances forward, you know, that I would not be burdensome to you. That's how you're inferior to the other churches, right? It's not all these fights that they were having. It's not all these, these, these problems they had that caused, made them to be inferior. The fact is that all the other churches were financially given of themselves to pay for the church workers, but this church was not doing that. Okay, that's how they became, they were inferior. It's, it's, it's that sarcasm of Paul, because then he goes, forgive me this wrong. So if he felt wrong that he was um, being sarcastic toward this church, if you can understand that, okay? Verse 14. So like, he has a dig at him. <laughs> he has a dig at him. Verse 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So now Paul is making his third attempt uh, or, or th preparing himself to visit them the third time. Now the first time was to establish the church, if you remember that. The second time he prepared himself to come, but he didn't make it all the way. Because he couldn't find Titus. You remember that? He couldn't find Titus. So he went to, into Macedonia. And then they had a bunch of persecutions in, in Macedonia. He didn't make his way to uh, the Corinthian church. So now the third time he's making himself ready. He's preparing now a third time to go and visit them. Um, and I will, 
And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. So look, yeah, I had a dig at you, but I'm not seeking your finances. I'm seeking you. I want to help you grow. I want to help you mature. I want to help you serve the Lord. That's what I'm after. Okay, I'm after that. I'm not after your finances. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So he uses this analogy. He's the father in the faith. He's a spiritual father. Just like parents go to work, have children, provide their food, provide their shelter. In the same way, Paul is saying, look, you know, yeah, I'm sarcastic towards you. But look, I'm actually coming to serve you. I'm not coming there to take from you, but to give to you. Okay, to help you, to help you mature and grow. Verse 15. And I will very glad I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So look, I, I'm willing to to give everything of myself for you. I, I'm willing to give more and, and above measure. But he goes, look, it just seems like the more I give of you, the more I love you, the less you love me. It's kind of like the more I give to you, the more you take me for granted. The more you take me for granted. And, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about how can we apply this to us? How can we this apply this to us? And I, I'm just thinking, you know, when we started this church, everyone was excited, right? The novel, novelty of it all. You know, everyone was looking forward to the church, of, of getting involved in the work, coming to every service, all those kind of things. And I believe you're still excited. We're, we're approaching our one year anniversary. But you know what? At some point... It's going to start to wear off, that novelty that we have, this new church here on the Sunshine Coast. At some point, it's going to start to wear off. And at some point, we're going to take it for granted. You know, all of us, oh, it's here. It's not going away. And, you know, you know maybe you start skipping services or, you know, you don't take it, make it a priority of your life anymore. You, you don't really pray about the church anymore. Hey, we need to be careful of this. We need to make sure we don't take our church for granted. We need to make sure that we stay encouraged, make sure that we stay uh, positive about this church and keep making this a priority in our lives, okay? Because this is easy. They took advantage of Paul. You know, they were probably excited when he first came. We have an apostle of Christ. But now it's kind of like, oh yeah, the more he makes himself available, the less exciting it seems, okay? So uh, just keep that in mind. Hey, you know, if, if, if church starts to feel like a burden to you, it's not as exciting. Oh, we can skip this service or skip that service. Hey, you're in the wrong. You're in the wrong. You know, you need to make sure it's always a priority in your life. Verse 16. And be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? So have I ever profited from you? You know, I've never taken from you financially. Even those that I've sent unto you, they didn't gain from you. Sorry, Callum. Do you mind? I'm getting a bit distracted. So he says, look, I've not, I've not um, uh, burdened you. I've not taken from you financially. Um, but even those that I sent unto you, they didn't gain from you. They didn't take any profit from you. You know, verse 18, I desired Titus. And with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did Titus take any finances? No. No one has profited from you financially. Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? So it appears that there were some sort of baseless accusations here. The fact that he has to reinforce the fact, hey, I've, you've never paid me. I'm serving you freely. I, I'm not, I don't want to be a burden to you. And even those that I sent to serve you in the church have not been a burden to you. No one has asked from you financially. But we know in the previous chapter, the false apostles were asking money, were asking for money. Okay? So again, he's, he's reinforcing that point. Okay? And, and look at verse 8, 16 again. He says, nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile meaning that they were paying these false apostles. I caught you out, okay? You, you, you're listening to the wrong people. You know, you, you're paying the wrong kind of people. You're paying the people that are trying to destroy your church, okay? Doesn't this prove the fact that I love you? Doesn't this prove the fact that we want to serve you? Doesn't this prove the fact that I'm not seeking my own gain, but I'm seeking your gain? And doesn't this prove the fact that these false apostles mentioned in the previous chapter are trying to take you for granted, are trying to make gain of you? Okay, that's what he's reinforcing here. Verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. So I find it a little bit hard to understand that, but I think this is what he's saying. Um, verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves to you? 
Do you think I've, set, I've spent, you know, uh, chapters 10, chapters 11, chapters 12 to defend myself? Paul's like, I don't have to defend myself, okay? I don't need to excuse myself, is what he's saying. We speak before God in Christ. I don't need to defend myself. God knows the truth. God knows what's going on. God knows that I'm not here to take advantage of you. But we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. This is, this is why I, I'm, I'm glorying, I'm boasting a little bit to you, even though it's foolish to do so. This is why it's for your edification. So you know that we are the true apostles of Christ, that we are you know, the ones that are here to serve you. That's why I'm doing it. And um, you know, to edify the church, to know, for the church to know that the Lord loved them so much that he would send an apostle of Christ to them, that he loved them so much, even when they were failing, that Paul would write a letter to rebuke them, that the Lord loved them so much that he wanted them to expel these false brethren from the church, these false apostles from the church. That's how he was edifying this church, okay? And um, let me just say this, and I think this is important, especially in light of some of the things that have gone on YouTube, you know, and maybe surrounding me a little bit as well. But I like in verse 19 how it says, Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. Hey, he says, look, I don't need to defend myself. You know, sometimes when there are false accusations, when there are lies about you or whatever, you don't have to defend yourself every time. The Lord knows. Okay? I don't have to get out, come up, go on YouTube and make public announcements and try to clear the air of anything like that all the time. Maybe, maybe there comes a time where you have to do something like that. But hey, look, if there's some stupid person making false rumors, you know, lying about you, look, sometimes who cares? I don't need to defend myself. The Lord knows. And the people that love me and care about me, the people that know me personally, they know the truth. That's what matters. You know, I don't need to defend myself. Sometimes it's almost like you have to defend yourself because you're not even sure about yourself, right? So, uh, you know, just be mindful of that. Yes, there's a time to defend yourself, guys, but also give space for God to step in and defend you. You know, if you've done right, you've, you, you're of the truth, you've done nothing wrong, many times, hey, just let the Lord deal with it. Okay, you don't need to defend yourself all the time. Verse number 20. For I fear, lest when I come... I shall not find you such as I would. So again, you know, just, I'm afraid when I come, you know, I've heard good things about you. You've improved a lot. I've heard it from Titus. I'm excited about all that stuff, but I'm a little afraid when I come unto you, you're going downhill again, right? This is why Paul is just, you know, again, criticizing them a little bit. Hey, keep working hard. Get rid of these false teachers. Uh, uh, I shall not find you such as I would. And that I should be found unto you such as ye would not. So, you know, if I find you, you know, backsliding again, then you're going to find me the way you don't want to find me. Okay, because he's going to come and again, criticize them in person. He's going to be very sharp and very, uh, very hard with his words toward them. Lest there be any debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. I, I would have liked to go through all that. I just don't have the time right now. But he's obviously saying, hey, look. I'm, I'm worried that you're going to get worse. You got better, you know, but deal with these final few things that you have to deal with. Okay, deal with these false apostles. Get them out. Deal with your finances. Send your finances to, you know, finish that donation to the, to the uh, needy believers in Jerusalem. Finish these final things that you need to deal with just so to make sure that when I come back, things aren't getting worse. Okay, verse 21. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I should, shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. I think when he says there that my God will humble me among you, he goes, look, if I come and things are like a lot worse than where they should be or where they were, then that's going to humble me. That's going to kind of like humiliate, humiliate me. Okay, it's, it's not a good, good thing for them to go in this downward spiral. And he says, and that I shall bewail. He's going to mourn about it, right? He's going to come. He wants to come. He wants to encourage the church. He wants to bless the church. He wants to be blessed by the church. But should he come and they're in all these manners of sin, they've gone backwards, he's going to have to be humiliated and he's going to be mourning. And then he's going to have that sharp rebuke back to the church. That's not, how it, that's not what he wants, right? He wants to come and have a good time with the church and not have to, you know, hopefully this second letter gets them finally all settled before his third journey. Now, that's all we have. Well, we have one more chapter. 
But um, we don't have anything else about the church in Corinthian. We don't know how further they developed. But I think it's awesome that we do see their growth, you know, from 1 Corinthians, their struggles, to 2 Corinthians, their improvement. But even when they had improved, Paul continues saying, hey, keep going, keep improvement, keep improving, you know, get better, strive for higher standards. And I think as a church, you know, we need to be mindful of these things. You know, I think we're a good church. Can we be better? Yeah, we can be better. You know, we should never get to a point where we're just comfortable where we are. You know, we should always be striving to serve the Lord more. You know, never get to a point where we're like, oh, we made it. This is where we need to be. And just and try to maintain that. When you start maintaining that, that's when you start going backwards. But it's when you're trying to achieve more for the Lord, that's when we can continue to uh, improve ourselves as a church. All right, let's pray.